This evening we're looking at a very familiar passage. I'm sure it's one you've memorized at some point in your lives. Romans 12, verses 1 and 2. Romans 12, verses 1 and 2, that comes after 11 chapters of, we might say, doctrine. And this is where uh, Paul begins to apply the doctrine to uh, his readers. Um, and certainly, I think that's what is summarized by this uh, statement, by uh, the mercies of God. Uh, all these things that Paul speaks about in the book of Romans really applies to you if you're a believer. All of these things the Lord has done for you, and all of these things call you to a particular sacrifice, and that is the sacrifice of your lives to him, which is what we read about in Romans 12, verses 1 and 2. Paul says, I urge you, therefore, brethren, by the mercies of God, to present your bodies a living and holy sacrifice, acceptable to God, which is your spiritual service of worship. And do not be conformed to this world, but be transformed by the renewing of your mind, that you may prove what the will of God is, that which is good and acceptable and perfect. May the Lord bless his word to build us up this evening in holiness. Now, just again, by way of quick reminder, we, we have seen certain things about how it is that we might grow into the likeness of Jesus Christ, how we can put off our sin, which is entirely unlike him, and put him on. In other words, become more like him. And certainly we've seen one thing that's repeated in our text now, and that is that we must not be conformed to the world. We must not love the world. We do need to realize that these, you know, these celebrities, these, these people that are out there, these great actors and singers and sports figures and so forth, are all of the world. They have a different standard. They, they, they you know, have different morals, and they're a part of the kingdom of darkness, and we can't use them as examples. Every once in a while, they may do something that's good. That's, that's fine. But they are not like Jesus. The Lord wants you to be like him and not like those of the world. So we have to, first of all, separate ourselves from desiring the things of the world, desiring what they have, desiring to be like them, and focus on Jesus. Now, in order to do that, we've also seen we need to give ourselves continually to prayer, to pray that God would transform us, that he would make us more like him, and that he would show us his will, and that he would fulfill his promises to us, among which are promises that we can become more like his son, the Lord Jesus Christ. And of course, the Lord doesn't just leave us in the dark as to what Jesus is like. He has given us his word, and his word shows us what Jesus is. He shows us what his will is. He shows us many things in the word. So as we saw last week, we do need to read the word of God, and we need to read it in faith, and we need to apply it. We do need to believe what it says. We do need to embrace the promises. We do need to obey the commandments. We need to tremble at the threatenings. We need to respond in a way that's appropriate to God's word. Again, it's not enough to know it. The Lord wants us to live it, and that's what we're going to see, I think, more clearly this evening. Tonight, Paul urges us to one more thing. I think it's interesting the way that he introduces it uh, to us here or to his readers. And again, the Lord gave this to the church in Rome, but also he's given it to the church as a whole. Paul doesn't say, I command you, brethren, by the mercies of God, but rather I urge you. This is a, a plea uh, that he has given to us. And of course, there's many reasons why he urges this upon us. Now, we do know from other places in Scripture that this is, in fact, commanded, that we do this, but Paul has given so many reasons, shown so many mercies that God has, has shown to uh, you know, the believers at Rome, that he urges this upon them as the only possible response. This is what we owe to him. And of course, this is also very important that we do this because if we are to honor him, we must give him this. We must give him ourselves. 
Now, basically, that's what he means by worshiping the Lord, is to give ourselves to him. Not just for an hour. You know, many Christians believe that the, the worship that God desires of us is simply to meet with him on Sunday with, with the people of God and to spend a worship service. To, you know, many churches try to keep it just an hour in length, and so you give that hour to the Lord, and you've given him the worship that he desires. No, it's more than that. And it's more than, than giving him the day, uh, than giving him the Lord's day, than observing the fourth commandment that tells us to set aside or to remember the Lord's day to keep it holy. The Lord wants us to give him our lives. He wants us to present our bodies to him as a living and holy sacrifice, at the same time withdrawing our hearts from the world, renewing our minds in his word that we may know his will and not just know it, but actually live it, that we might actually please God with our whole life. This is our spiritual service of worship. Now this evening we're looking at the third means of grace. We're looking at worship and we want to see uh, four things about it. First of all, what it means to worship, although I've already told you what that is. When we are to worship, why we are to worship, and how we are to worship. I think uh, there's much more that could be said about this than we could possibly uh, manage in this time, but at least we'll get some, uh, some things behind this and hopefully be encouraged to do this more. Now, what does it mean to worship the Lord? Well, Paul tells us here, most simply, it means to present ourselves to God as a living sacrifice. Now, why a living sacrifice? Well, because, you know, in the New Testament, it's different than it was in the Old Testament. In the Old Testament, they brought sacrifices to God, but those sacrifices were actually put to death so that they could be burned and offered up to the Lord. So those necessarily had to die. But after the sacrifice of his son, the Lord Jesus Christ, we no longer bring those kinds of sacrifices to the Lord. The Lord wants a different kind of sacrifice. Author to the Hebrews tells us that we are to continually offer to him the sacrifice of our lips. We certainly want to do that. But Paul tells us he wants more than our lips. He wants our whole body. You see, he wants everything. He wants our whole lives to give ourselves to him to serve him as he directs us in his word. This is what worship is, to do all that we do, everything, to the glory of God. Now, that's what it means to worship the Lord. By the way, that's what we're doing here. Here, I think, you know, there's a certain uh, set of rules that the Lord would have us to observe to do the things that would be honoring to him. Here, we might give him perhaps the most concentrated, the most attentive worship that we can give him. But again, all of life is to be worship. And I think that answers the second question, which is when are you to worship? Well, again, it's not just for the hour that we're meeting together during the worship services, which I've already said is perhaps the most concentrated worship, where we give the Lord our full attention. I hope, at least I hope that's what we're doing, that's what we need to be doing giving him our full and our best attention to sing his praises, to pray and to thank him for his mercies as well as to ask for further mercies, to hear his word. Again, remembering that what we're doing here is not something that man thought of, which would be a good thing to do, but something that Jesus appointed in his church. And when his word is proclaimed, the Lord is speaking to us. If what is said actually agrees with his word, this is Jesus speaking with us. That's why we always need to, of course, examine everything and compare it to the word. But if it agrees with the word, then this is the Lord's word to us. And so we need to pay attention to it and listen to it. This is where we receive his supper and remember his sacrifice that he made for us and what that sacrifice calls us to do. As Paul reminds us this evening, even as Jesus offered himself up for us, we are to offer our lives to him as a living sacrifice, our whole lives.
Now, again, this is why this morning I mentioned that we should not allow ourselves to be distracted during this time of worship because worship is not a show. It's not entertainment. It's not like going to a movie, although sometimes, you know, when you go into churches, as I mentioned this morning, it, it seems like you're, you're going into a movie theater with a concession stand up front, all the frills, all the refreshments and so forth. Uh, you take it in and you sort of eat your popcorn while the, the minister is preaching or maybe while the choir is singing or wherever it may be. But that's not what worship is. That's not what we're doing here. We are actually meeting with God. And the attention that we show in the service, we're actually being attentive to him or not being attentive to him. This is his service, and we are to be focusing on him, which is why, again, we need to take care of all of our business beforehand. I mean, we, some of the things that we may do or that, that Christians may do in a worship service, they would never do if they were meeting even with you know, the president of the nation or perhaps a dignitary from some other country, you would show them respect by your full attention. And you wouldn't just keep getting up and down and, and doing other things and, and occupying yourself with other things. You would be focused on what's going on there. Well, again, the Lord is here. And we need to give him our full attention. The Lord, as it were, descends, although he doesn't really have to descend. He's everywhere at once to meet with us. And as Calvin says, he, we're lifted up into the heavenlies by the Spirit of God to worship there. God is with us either way. And we do need to show him that, that honor and that respect. So when are we to worship? Well, we are to worship in this hour, or this hour and a half. But it's more than that. And as I mentioned, it's, it's more than the day that he calls us to worship him, although we are to do that. The Lord calls us to, to give to him one day in seven. That's what the fourth commandment tells us to do, remember the Sabbath day to keep it holy. And the Sabbath did not pass away from the Old Testament to the New. It just simply changed days from the seventh day of the week to the first day of the week when our Lord Jesus Christ rose from the dead. The Sabbath remains, the author to the Hebrews tells us, because of the one who has passed through the heavenlies, because of the one who has died and entered into his rest. And the fact that this day remains means that there is still the possibility that you and I can enter into that rest, and that's what we need to be striving to do. But the Lord knows how the world can take us away from him, our thoughts and our attention, and so he desires to wean us from the world by setting us apart from the world one whole day that we devote to him. This is his day. It's called in scripture the Lord's day. It belongs to him, and he wants you to spend that day with him. He wants you to remember it and to keep it holy. Remember the Sabbath day to keep it holy. And so we take care of all of our worldly interests beforehand to make sure that we can spend this day with him. And really, what, what believer who hopes to spend eternity with God in heaven and with the Lord Jesus Christ could balk at that? If you really love the Lord and you want to spend eternity with him, is it really so hard to spend a day with him? Actually, the believer would wish that every day would be the Lord's day so that we wouldn't have to, to do these other things that take us away from him but can focus on him. But again, the Lord wants even more than that. He wants all of our life to be worshipped to him, not just the hour, not just the day. I think sometimes we think if we've done our duty on the Lord's day and spent that day with him, then we can take the other six days and do what we want to do. Well, that's not the case. Paul tells us again in Romans 12, verse 1, Therefore I urge you, brethren, by the mercies of God, to present your bodies a living and holy sacrifice, acceptable to God, which is your spiritual service of worship. Now the scriptures tell us that when Jesus Christ died on the cross, he purchased you with his own blood. And that you no longer belong to yourself, but you belong to him. And so he says in 1 Corinthians 6.20, Therefore, glorify God with your bodies. Use them for him. We just saw in Romans chapter 6 that you've been 
you've died with Jesus Christ and you've been buried with him. That is the, the old man, the old way of living, the old selfish self that lived for self has been buried, is now dead. But you've been raised again to life. Christ lives in you now. And you are no longer to live as you used to live, but now you are to live for him. And so the question that we, we ask as, as we're thinking about what to do with our time and our lives is not no longer what, what do I want to do? You know, how do I want to spend this time? Where do I want to go? What do I want to do kind of thing? But rather, what would you have me to do, Lord? It's exactly what Paul asked as he was on his way to do his own thing. Again, Saul, the Pharisee on his way to Damascus with papers from the officials in Jerusalem to find any Christians, bind them, and bring them back for trial. He was on his way to do what he wanted to do. He hated Christians and wanted to destroy the church. But as soon as the Lord knocked him off his horse and converted him, the first words that came out of his mouth were, Lord, what do you want me to do? You see, this is what we need to be asking and what we need to be doing. So when are we to worship the Lord? Well, we are to worship him during the worship service, of course, and we are to worship him on his holy day, but we are to be giving him our whole lives. We are to be worshiping him always. Now, thirdly, why should you worship the Lord with your whole life? Well, the most obvious reason is what Paul has already given to us here. He says, I urge you, therefore, brethren, by the mercies of God... When you consider all that the Lord has done for you, I mean, he made you, he takes care of you, he redeemed you with the blood of his son. When you think of all that he has saved you from, the hell that you deserve and is giving to you heaven, what's the proper response for that? Do you give him an hour a week? Do you give him passing thought? Or maybe sometimes you go to worship and sometimes you don't. Do you give him his day? That's not enough. As a matter of fact, if you spend from now to the end of your life, doing all that you could possibly to serve him, that would in no way repay what you owe him. You can never repay him for what he has done. I mean, he's paid an infinite price for your redemption. So then what can you give him? Well, the only thing that you can, which is your whole life, in a continual act of worship. That's the very least that you can do, and it certainly is what the Lord calls you to do. By the way, you don't lose out when you do that. That is where the true blessing is, is by walking with the Lord. If you're a believer especially, you're never happy unless you are walking in his ways. So what he's calling you to do is what he's already given you the desire to do, which is to follow him and to live for him and to be useful to him. But here's another reason why you should worship the Lord with your whole life. And it really has to do with usefulness. And that is, if you don't serve the Lord all the time, then you're continually going to find yourself in a situation where you're not able to be used by the Lord. Because when you're not serving the Lord, who are you serving? You're basically serving yourself or you're serving Satan. And of course, when you do that, what happens to your spirituality? What happens to your desire to serve the Lord? Well, as we've already seen, it cools off. Every time you turn from the Lord, you cool the Spirit's work, and you make yourself that less able and that less uh, ready to serve the Lord. Because when the opportunity arises, you have to try to call yourself back Call your heart back, call your mind back to do the Lord's work. And by that time, generally, the opportunities are gone. Now, if you live that way, if you live a divided kind of life where sometimes you're serving the Lord, sometimes you're serving yourself, it's no wonder that, again, when the opportunity presents itself, you're just not ready. I mean, I could ask for a show of hands. I'm not going to do that. But how many times have you had the opportunity to do something for the Lord, but you weren't ready because it caught you off guard. Why did it catch you off guard? It's because you weren't moving in that direction already, the direction that the Lord would have you to be going. We have to resolve to be completely His, not to have a foot in the world and a foot in heaven, 
not to compromise. I think this really, again, comes from loving the Spirit's work. For those of you who are involved in the Pilgrim's Progress study, uh, there was the conversation between Pilgrim or Christian and uh, Prudence. And Prudence asks Pilgrim, or again, Christian, this question. He says, um, uh, have you ever found yourself in situations where you, your desires to sin basically feel like you, you've conquered those and you're, you're all the Lord's? And he says, yes, but very few. <laughs> There's very few times like that. And she said, well, when you experience them, what is it that you're doing? And he says, well, I'm meditating on the cross. I'm thinking about what Jesus Christ has done for me. And he lists off several things, and they all have to do with his heart and his mind focusing on the Lord. Now, if you've had those kinds of experiences where you feel the Spirit's work inside of you, you feel that strength and that power, and you feel prepared, and the Lord actually uses you, and you know what a joy and pleasure it is, then you know what it's like to have the Spirit of God working in you. That's something you should love and something you should cherish and something you should want to protect. And the way you protect it, again, is by worshiping the Lord all the time with your whole life, being willing to serve at all times, praying at all times, living uh, in the presence of God, being aware of His presence and of his will at all times, seeking to do, in other words, what, what Paul tells us we ought to be doing, seeking to do whatever you do, whether you eat or drink or whatever you do, all for the glory of God. Now, why did Paul say, you know, you know whatever you do, do for the glory of God, whether you eat or drink or whatever you do? Why did he choose whether you eat or drink? It's because those are the most insignificant, seemingly insignificant and mundane things that we do in life. And if you're not seeking to glorify God in this small thing, then you're not going to be seeking to do it in the bigger things. The Lord wants everything we do to be done for his glory. That's a question we need to be asking ourselves whenever we're setting our hearts to do anything. Does this glorify him? Is this going to be honoring to him? Can I offer this to him as, as worship? That's the only way we'll preserve the Spirit's work be strong in the Lord and be ready to be used by him at any time if we give ourselves fully to his worship. So what it means to worship again is to give our whole lives to him. When we are to worship is at all times. Why is because of all he's done and because it's the only way that you can really be useful to the Lord is by giving yourself to him at all times. So finally, how are you to worship the Lord? What are some of the things that we can do? We've already seen some of these things implied. The first one is, of course, you do need to be a Christian. If you're not a Christian, you can't glorify him at all. You first need to trust Jesus Christ and turn from your sins. If, if anything you're going to do is going to be acceptable to him. Because as long as you live for self, as long as you're unrepentant, the Lord will not receive you. You do need to trust him and turn from your sins. Secondly, you do need to resolve to keep yourself unstained by the world. We really need to look at the world as a mass of pollution and filth and dirt. And it's not, you know, the, the dirt that's out there and the mud for mud runs or things like that or when you're hiking up in the mountains and so forth. We're not talking about the world in its physical form. Right? We're talking about the morality of the world. You need to keep yourself separate from those who are worldly and from worldly principles and things like that. As long as you come in contact with that kind of stuff and submerge yourself in it, it's going to soil your mind and your heart. It's going to make you dirty. It's going to incapacitate you to serve the Lord. It will weaken you. Now, thankfully, the Lord has removed all the filth from our souls by his blood. He has taken away our guilt, and he has broken the power of sin in our lives. However, we do still live in this world, and because we live in this world, we're going to be affected by it 
And to the degree that we are affected to that degree, we are not going to be able to serve the Lord. We're not going to be able to worship him as we should, so we need to withdraw. I mean, consider what Paul says in verse 2. Do not be conformed to this world, but be transformed by the renewing of your mind. Don't think like the world. You know, if you're continually admiring the world, you're going to think like the world. You need to admire Jesus Christ who is revealed in Scripture, who reveals to us what God is like. Be transformed by the renewing of your mind. Know what the Lord's will is. Think his will. Desire his will. Do his will. Do what Paul says, that which is good, that is acceptable to him, that is perfect. Again, this idea of proving the will of God means not just knowing what the will of God is, but actually doing it and knowing by experience that this is his will, it is pleasing to him, and it is good. Everything God calls us to do is good. Oh, I have to keep saying that. Sometimes I think we, you know, our flesh reacts to this when God says, you must do this, and we, you know, we immediately feel, wait a minute, I don't, I don't want to do that. I want to be told that I have to do this. And, uh, you know, there's a lot of churches today, many churches, their theology is, uh, well, I even heard it taught at the college I went to. The Lord says you should do this, but he doesn't say you must do this. What? Lord, there's no option. Sin is not an option. Shall we sin that grace may abound? God forbid, Paul says. We, that's not the way we understand Scripture. No, we must do it, but again, the must, we kind of recoil a bit at that. But remember that what God tells us we must do is good. Good for us, good for others, not offensive to him, but pleasing to him. It does nothing but help. It is nothing but pure love. That is what he calls us to do. And so the fact that he tells us we must love is not a bad thing. It is a good thing. So we do need to, of course, first of all, be Christian. Secondly, we need to make sure we withdraw from the world. Thirdly, in order to prove his word, we must do what the word of God actually tells us to do. We need to live according to that word. That's how we worship him. You know, there's a, there's a principle in reform worship. Uh, that we call the regulative principle. Perhaps you've heard that uh, term before. And what that means is simply this, that God tells us how he wants us to worship him. And so that's what we do during a worship service. So why don't we have, you know, entertainment? Why don't we have, you know, bands? Why don't we have, uh, uh, you know, solos? Why don't we have choirs? You know, why don't we have drama? Why don't we just, you know, have Christian comedians or um, you know, things like that, Okay. Well, it's because the Lord has not told us to do that in his word. He's told us to do certain other things, and those are the things that we're doing. And the reason is because those things are pleasing to him. That is the kind of worship that he will accept, the kind that, that he calls us to give him. Again, you, you get this idea, well, you know, people want to do other things thinking that somehow it's going to be pleasing to God, but how do you know it's going to be pleasing to him? If he doesn't actually tell you, it's going to be pleasing to him. Calvin warned us, you know, that the human mind is a factory of idolatry. We should not trust what we want to do. We should only trust the word of God. So that's why we worship the way we do in the worship service, why we have the particular things that we do and not the other things that perhaps other churches might do. But the regulative principle applies not only to the worship we do here, it applies to the worship that we give to the Lord in the rest of our lives as well. In other words, we need to frame our lives by what God's word says is pleasing to him. We need not only to do what he says, or excuse me, know what he says, we need to do what he says. And that also means that if we're doing things that we don't know are pleasing to him, that there's some question about that we can't do in faith, then we need to make sure we don't do those things because the Lord tells us whatever is not of faith is sin. Even if that thing isn't actually sinful, if we're not sure, then we shouldn't do it because it's sin for us because we're not doing it in faith. Uh, in college I went to, the professor used the example of a chocolate milkshake. 
if you had this phobia or this fear that it might be a sin for you to drink a chocolate milkshake, then you shouldn't drink a chocolate milkshake. And if you do, that's sin for you, even though it may not actually be a sin to do so. Everything we do must be in faith, and how can we do anything in faith unless we know it agrees with the word of God? And so you need to use the word as basically a map to chart your course from where you are now all the way to Mount Zion, all the way to heaven. Live according to the word of God. It's the only safe guide that you have. And then finally, in order to worship the Lord, you have to resolve not to turn aside from doing what God calls you to do, even as we saw this morning. You know, follow that example of zeal that Jesus gives you for God's honor and glory. And don't turn aside, regardless of what the danger may be that you see ahead, regardless of the cost. Don't turn aside for anything or for anyone. Don't let your friends, you know, turn you aside and, and, and draw you away from worshiping the Lord. Certainly don't let your enemies resolve to walk on the path that the Lord has charted for you. Again, regardless of the cost. You know, that's a principle that the saints who stand out in history, the ones that we appreciate today, that's the path they walked. Remember Athanasius. He's, he's a wonderful example because Athanasius at one point seemed to be the only uh, teacher, the only theologian in the church that was standing for the Trinity. And the rest basically had, had abandoned it for the idea of this oneness, you know, uh, be, to be sort of anachronistic to call it Socinianism, but it's the idea of Unitarianism, that there's only one person in the Godhead. And Athanasius actually lost his job five times and was exiled from his country five times. You know, as, as the uh, theological shift would take place in the church, the Trinity, he'd be brought back, uh, Unitarian, he'd get kicked out again and just kept shifting back and forth. But every step along the way, he fought that battle. And sometimes it seems like he stood alone for the truth. He was willing to pay the price. And so was the Apostle Paul, as you know, who faced a great deal of persecution at the hands of his countrymen. Sometimes it seems like when you, know, when you set your heart to worship the Lord and to honor him in all things, sometimes it seems like you're the only one that's doing this, that you're resolving to do what's right. But you've got to do that if you're going to worship the Lord the way he wants you to worship him. You have to resolve to do it, to stand for that truth, even if you're the only one who's doing it. Now, this is the worship that the Lord wants from you. He wants the entirety of your life. He doesn't want just the hour, just the day. He doesn't want part-time worship. You're not part-time children of God. You've been adopted into his household. You're full-time children. Jesus died to purchase you, to buy you. You belong to him. And he wants you to live as though you do belong to him and not to yourselves. Now, this is how you are to worship the Lord, Paul tells us. And of course, our Lord tells us, and many other places in Scripture tell us. And it's in this way that you're actually going to be able to grow, to overcome your sins, to put on Christ, to have a love that is growing hotter for the Lord, to be more useful for Him, to give Him greater glory. If you're a Christian here this evening, this, I hope, is your goal. That's what the Lord calls you to do. And if it is your goal, then you should be interested in the things that have been said because this is the way that it has to be done. As long as you divide your heart between two different things, it's going to render you weak and ineffective. You have to give your heart fully to the Lord. So may God grant us that grace, since that really is the only way to do it. May he grant us the grace not just to desire this, because by desiring it, it's not enough. You actually have to do it. May he grant us the grace then to do it, to consecrate ourselves fully to him.
for his worship. Well, let's bow in a moment of prayer and, and let's ask that the Lord might grant us that grace to do that.